Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. But I want to speak on the subject. We can continuing on the beginning of our series, The King, the Keys, and the Kingdom. This is a series that will last until 2006. So you might as well get used to the kingdom. We're going to go through understanding the three most important components in the entire plan of God for man. The three most important components that you need to know about is the king. We must know about the king. We must know about the kingdom. And we must know about the keys of the kingdom. And I want to deal with this morning on the subject focusing on the kingdom principle of keys. The kingdom principle of keys. This is session number two. Last week we introduced the series. Today we are going to begin focusing on the kingdom. We're going to talk about the principle of keys in the kingdom of God. Let us really as a subtitle focus on understanding the kingdom and the keys that make it work understanding the kingdom and the keys that make it work first let's talk a little bit about rediscovering the good news Jesus came to earth with only one message one message he did not preach on healing he did not preach on deliverance. His message was really not about miracles. He did not preach on religion. He did not preach about born again. That was not his message. His message was a simple message. I'm going to show you from your own Bible today some references to that message that he himself declared. First of all, I want you to write these principles down. Number one, the purpose for man's creation was to administrate a kingdom. That is what God created man for. Man was not created to make a religion or even to be in one. Man was created to administrate a kingdom. Principle number two, the fall of man was the loss of a kingdom. When Adam fell, he did not lose heaven. He was never given heaven. He lost a kingdom. Third principle to write down, the purpose of redemption was to restore a kingdom. If God sent his Christ to restore something it must be what we lost so you can tell what Adam lost by what Jesus came to restore solutions always give indications of the problem it's a paradox you can tell what a problem is by what the solution is so whatever Jesus came to earth to bring as a solution, that must have been the problem. So Adam was not restored to heaven. A kingdom was restored to Adam. Number four principle, the fulfillment of God's will is the reestablishment of his kingdom on earth. God's will will be fulfilled when his kingdom was to be established on earth. That is God's plan after Adam fell. God had one goal and that was to reestablish his kingdom of heaven on earth. 
And the final principle I want you to make a note of in your notes is that the program of salvation was to restore man to the kingdom government of God. And please write both words together. To restore man to the kingdom government of God. So whatever God brought to earth, it had to be a government because that's what man lost. Today I have come to the conclusion that the greatest news in the world is the news that Jesus brought to earth. And by the way, the word good news in the Greek language is the word evangelium. And that word in the Greek New Testament is the word we translate as gospel. Good news. Why is the promise of a government good news? The answer, because no government on earth right now is working. None. The Chinese cannot stop SARS. The Afghan government is still unstable and they're killing soldiers every day. They tried to correct Iraq, but now American soldiers are being killed every day at the checkpoints. And there's still no order in the country. America, who is presumably possessing the best government in the world, has the highest crime rate in the world. Marriages are being dissolved in America more than in any other country in the world. Divorce is one to one. For every two get married, one get divorced. More babies are killed in America than are born in the Caribbean every year. 500,000 are killed in the womb. That's the greatest government of all time. The murder capital of America is Washington, D.C. The capital of the greatest country in the world is the highest crime rate for murder or homicide in the whole country. In other words, is that government working? And then we shift on down to Africa and we get depressed. Which government in Africa is working? People are being killed by their own government, by the thousands in the African states. Their own people are having genocide committed upon them by governments who claim to be for the people. And we go to China, the largest country in the world, over one billion people. 80% of the people live in poverty and they claim that communism is for equal distribution but yet only the rich enjoy the benefits of the communist state. Where can we find a government that works? That's why Jesus bought a government. Secondly, I'm glad he didn't bring a religion. No religion is working. The number one problem in the world today is a religious problem. The terrorists are using their religion to justify their actions. Islam is bent on destroying every infidel, which means anyone who's not a Muslim is an infidel. If you're an infidel, they either tolerate you, make you a slave, or they destroy you. That's their religious tenet. Hinduism has over 600 million gods. Which one do you serve? What a confusing religion. Buddhism has great sayings that don't work. Baha'i, I believe everybody is right. So wherever you go, you end up the same place. How do you live that way? Any road will take you there. Scientologists put their faith in science, which itself simply discovers what God already made. What religion is working? Even Christianity is not working. It's a religion. Christianity has killed more people in the name of God than any other religion. And most of the folks I know in Christianity are depressed, frustrated, sad, and broke. If religion is the answer, we still got some questions. 
It's important for you to understand the solution that Jesus brought. Because if you understand the solution, you'll understand what the problem is. He did not bring a religion. He brought a kingdom. Please write this down. What is a kingdom? He introduces ministry in the book of Matthew chapter 4. Turn there please. A verse that I keep reading over and over and over again personally because it is the most important statement made by Jesus. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. I hope it becomes a part of your mind the way it is a part of mine. As a man think it, so is he. All I think now is kingdom. And friends, it is working in my life personally. Matthew 4 verse 17. Let me read it for you. Verse 17, NIV version. And from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. Quote, repent, comma, because the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Some translation says it is near. In other words, his first public announcement was the arrival of a kingdom, not a religion. And from that moment forward, you read all the other chapters, all the way to 28th chapter of Matthew, and every page is filled with one word. He kept repeating, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. He brought the kingdom to the earth. What is a kingdom? First of all, a kingdom is not a religion. So what makes up a kingdom? Now I want to say again, that those of us who were born in the Western world and maybe some of the South American areas, we have no concept of a real kingdom because we've been brought up in an environment of democracy and a republic. Republics and democracies are not kingdoms. They do not have the qualities or the characteristics of a kingdom, even though some parts of a republic may resemble pieces of a kingdom. They are completely opposite to kingdoms. That's why it's important to know what a kingdom is. A kingdom is not a parliamentary democracy. In the Bahamas, we don't have a kingdom. So if you read the Bible, through your experience, you will end up with the wrong result. If you approach the Bible from the point of view of a republic or a democracy, you will be confused. So first of all, a kingdom has the most important thing is a king in a democracy we have a, a prime minister or a president or a dictator but in a democracy there is no king a king is a sovereign the second thing that a kingdom has is a territory every kingdom must have a territory the territory is called the domain you cannot be a king of nothing there's got to be a place that you are ruling over. Number three, every kingdom must have citizens. The citizens in a kingdom are called subjects. Everybody say subjects. Now, there's a reason why they're called subjects. The word subject is important and should be embraced by you and I who claim to be in the kingdom of God. The word subject means to to get below sub means below subject means a citizen of a kingdom is completely under the king and they stay under for an important reason we're going to learn through the series why it's important to stay below the king the third fourth thing that a kingdom has rather is a constitution every kingdom has a constitution what is a constitution the Constitution is a covenant between the king and his subjects. And I want to stress that that Constitution is not written by the subjects. It is written by the king. The king determines the covenant or the Constitution that the people live by. In a democracy, the people write the Constitution. In a kingdom, the king writes it. In a Constitution, in a democracy, the laws are created by the people. In a kingdom, the law is created by the king. Matter of fact, the king's word becomes law. 
completely opposite the fifth thing that a kingdom has is laws these laws are called principles by which the kingdom functions every kingdom operates functions by laws now democracies and republics also function by laws except those laws are created by the people through a constitutional process that they agree to live by in a kingdom is not that way in a kingdom the words of the king becomes law so the people don't create the law in a kingdom the king does number six a kingdom has a government very important word government write the word government down carefully it has a ruling authority let me give you another word for government in your Bible write this word down please it's the word K O S M O S pronounce it for me say it loud for the camera people a little bit louder one more time shout it till the roof shake say it one more time say it two more times say it one more time now when your pastor tell you to say something that many times it means that it's important and you don't know what it means the word cosmos is all through your Bible New Testament and it's used by Jesus it's used by Paul it's used by Peter it's used by James it's used by all the writers of New Testament and this word cosmos is the Greek word that is translated as write this word down world world and I'm giving you this for a reason because you see when you think of the word government you don't think of this word the word government is the same word as cosmos cosmos is the word in your Bible for world this word world means order of authority write it down order of authority you remember Paul I'll give you one example where it is used Paul says in the 12th chapter of his writing to the church at Rome in verse 2 he says be not conformed to this world stop reading now I want you to think about the meaning there Paul uses the word cosmos when Paul says be not conformed to this world he ain't talking about going to the nightclub he ain't talking about drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes all the stuff you're thinking about no he said he used the word cosmos do not be conformed to this cosmos but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mindset your thinking why does he put the word cosmos in there what does the word cosmos mean world the word world cosmos means governing authority order of authority in other words he's telling us be no longer controlled by the other government it's a different concept why because we are fighting against kingdoms it's one kingdom against another and Paul says you used to be in this old kingdom and that old kingdom taught you how to think how to act and they train you they condition you how to respond and as a man think it so we see so he says you were in a cosmos now I want you to think about this he said you were living in a cosmos which means an actual government control you think the devil is a little imp with some horns and a pick fork let me tell you who the devil is the devil is an unemployed cherub parading as a king by default and he has set up a kingdom it's called the kingdom of darkness he ha literally has a government and he controls every human being that comes into the world the first thing he wants is to get them under his control which means he's got administration he's got a cabinet hello oh hear me see the Apostle Paul was smart he understood the whole thing Paul says you don't fight against flesh and blood but you fight against first of all what prince says 
And wicked spirits where? In high places. He says, and authorities in high places. You are fighting against a whole machinery of government. That's why you can't approach the devil with your little puny prayers. You got to be backed up by a government. You don't just stand before the devil talking about come out, come out. You better have a whole army behind you backing you up. A whole government power backing you up. That's why Jesus said when you go to him, don't use your name. Oh, getting ahead of myself. Every time I walk in front of an immigration booth in any country, you know what they ask for? Passport. They're not looking for me. Oh, y'all don't get it. When they ask for your passport, they're not looking for you. They don't care about you individually. They are looking for the authority that you come in. Lord, have mercy. And if you ain't got a passport, they send you back. Now, you here personally, you got money. You can pay and bring stuff into their country and benefit them. But they don't want you. They want to know the authority you're coming in, so they send you back if you ain't prepared. They are looking for what? A government. That's why your passport never belongs to you. Your passport has written on it, property of the Bahamas government, property of the United States government. Why? Because this, this piece of book, this thing that looks so simple, is an entire government that you are backed up by. If you get locked up, the first thing they take from you is your passport. Why? They take from you the support of your government because you don't qualify to live in the government society anymore. The hardest thing for you to get again is a passport. Because a passport is a kingdom you're holding in your hands. You come in the name of your government. So a government is important. Now I want you to think about this from now on. Every time you see the word world in your Bible, stop looking at it as a globe. That word is referring to an entire governing system. Watch this. You are in the world, but not. He ain't talking about planet Earth. He's talking about who's controlling your life. Whose government are you under? You live on the planet, but you're not controlled by the government of the planet. You're controlled by an invisible government from heaven. Can I hear an amen? amen. The next thing that, a, that a, a kingdom has is privileges. Privileges refer to the benefits and the rights of the citizen. Every kingdom has privileges. Now I want you to understand that it is a privilege for you to be given a right in a kingdom is a privilege for you to be given a right in a democracy is not a privilege <laughs> once you become a citizen the government has to do some things for you that's in a democracy in America, you can burn the flag and use the law to protect you. <laughs> In America, you can kill a baby and use the law to protect you from murder. Why? Because as a citizen, their laws give you certain rights. But do you know that in the kingdom of God, every right that you are given is a privilege? That means you're lucky. <laughs> Is that a good word? In other words, you don't stand before God and say, now nah, let me tell you something. Ever since you made me, you know, I can... no, no, you don't come before God with that attitude. What, what, that... Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me tell you, how, how are you saved? By what? Grace. You better shut your mouth and thank God you got saved. Everything is by grace in a kingdom. The king gives you grace. He extends what they call in kingdoms favor. Everybody say favor. Let me tell you something. Nothing is more powerful than a king's favor. Write this down. The king's favor becomes a personal law. The king's favor becomes what? 
a personal law. This is too heavy for you today, I know. The Lord will help you to buy this tape and you will listen to this again. This is so powerful. Last night I had to tell God, turn it off. I sat in my office at home, two o'clock, and I said, Lord, stop. I said, God, I cannot teach this in my lifetime. They won't get it. I'll die. And they still won't get it. Because you see, it is so heavy and so simple that we keep missing it because we are hungry, sleepy, tired. I'm going to say this again. Listen to me, friends. Listen to it. The favor of God, don't miss this, is a personal law. Now, you don't understand what I mean. Let me explain. A king has decrees. A decree is all the king spoke that becomes written that you, the, the citizens obey. But favor is a unique thing. A king can give you a personal law that you live by. Oh, you ain't get it. In other words, when a king gives you favor, that's not in the books. That's something he decides to give you personally as a privilege and the other uh, citizens might not get it. Oh, you don't understand. But for you, it becomes a law. It works for you all the time. Hallelujah. Oh, this is too heavy. You know, uh, if the Prime Minister of the Bahamas was to give anyone a personal favor, what do we call that? What do you call that? P politically speaking, what, what do you call that? Curry favor. Curry, curry favor. <laughs> if the Prime Minister was to withhold from you a personal favor, what do you call that? victimization okay therefore the prime minister or the president of a country cannot actually give you personal favor that is against the law or outside the law whatever he gives you have to be in the law already the king is different <laughs> you come to a king and guess what you don't deserve nothing but the king got the power and authority to tell you, I can still give you this. You ought to praise him. <laughs> and guess what? No one can break what he said to you, nor take it away. Why? It becomes a law to you. I'm going to shout by myself. That's why God going to bless you this week, even though you ain't deserve it, and other folks don't like it, and they can't stop it. He's going to decide, today I'm going to bless you. If you want to take that kind of favor, give him a hand. Praise God. The favor of God has nothing to do with what you do. Hallelujah. It's a private law. You remember that young guy who was a bartender working in the courts of the king? His name was Nehemiah. Just a worker. He wasn't a politician. He wasn't a secretary in government. He wasn't a member of the cabinet. He was a servant, a slave in the courts. But the king one day, Lord have mercy, turned to the guy and says, why are you so depressed? You don't serve my drinks with a smile anymore. And the young man said, my country is in shambles. The walls are broken down. My people are scattered. I am depressed because my country is in deplorable condition. And the king says, watch this, what do you want? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, all you want God to ask you once. Come on somebody. Because once the king talks, he's about to make a law that's only for you. Come on somebody. That's the difference, you see. The king creates laws by his mouth. And even though in that court there were famous generals, powerful politicians, secretaries, all kinds of members of, of the courts, of the government, that young slave boy was given some favor that the king said, go, do what's in your heart, 
I will give you letters. Man, this is powerful favor. I'm going to give you a letter that's going to give you clearance through every province. You can get all the money you want, the trees you want for lumber, all the nails, all the equipment from the king's warehouse. Go to my cedar forest, cut all the wood you want. Why? And if they ask you what you're doing, pull out the letter. Y'all better understand. Tell somebody, I'm going to get blessed this week. And no one can stop me. Clap your hands and shout for one second. The favor of the king. Oh, hallelujah. I tell you, you see, you think you got to buy everything that belongs to you. See, some of you got to wait. I got to buy. God says, no. All I got to do is say the word. God could talk to somebody to give you something that other people worked a thousand years for. He can give it to you in one day. The favor of the king is a personal law. It's a privilege to be under a king. Some of you are mad because people got promoted over you. Because someone in authority liked them better than you. And they ain't qualify. You know, they ain't quite you know, prepared for that job. But because of some kind of relationship, they got ahead of you. Well, I come to you in the name of another king to tell you, promotion doesn't come from the east, nor the west, nor the north, nor the south. But this time, promotion is coming from the Lord. And whom the Lord promotes, no man can demote in the name of the king. God promotes. You've been passed over, walked on. You've been ignored for the last 10 years. But I'm telling you, if you get this message and lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm under your favor, God will defy the authority, confuse the kings of the earth, and they'll promote you and can't explain why, and give you more money and can't explain how. You ought to give God thanks. It's going to happen in your life. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. That's why God says it doesn't come from the east. It doesn't come from people. Now in the world, you got to depend on people to promote you. But in the kingdom of God, just go to work on time. Work hard. Don't cheat the man. Don't steal his time. Don't steal his products. Be there. Why? Because when promotion comes from above, no one will be able to speak evil of your good. Promotion come in. Kingdom has privileges. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. <laughs> it's a benefit to be under the king. The next thing that a kingdom has, very important, is a code of ethics. And this one we are still struggling with. Every kingdom has a code of ethics. That means it has a lifestyle by which you live according to certain standards that you won't violate. There are certain things a king don't tolerate. And every kingdom has codes of ethics. And if I can say, let me get to this segment in the series. I'm going to work on this for about three weeks because most of us don't understand how critical this is. When you violate the king's codes, you actually forfeit the benefits and privileges. A code of ethics means that you live according to certain standards in the kingdom. Certain things the king has established that you will not compromise. And that's why every kingdom has a list of do's and don'ts. It's not to restrict you, it's to protect you. Lying, stealing, bearing false witness, covetousness. These things that, that we, we, we think as harsh, these are codes.
Jesus came to bring that. He came to bring a government. He came to bring a constitution. He came to restore the privileges. He came to reclaim a citizenry. He claimed to reestablish a lifestyle and a culture from heaven on earth. That's what he came to do. He didn't come to bring a religion. Let's read what he says here. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, For unto us a child will be born. This is the past tense now. Unto us a son shall be given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. He's coming with a government on his shoulders to deliver it to the human race. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign. He will not be in a religion as some potentate, but he will come as a king and he will reign. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it, upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on until how long? That means once the Messiah comes and he brings that government, it's going to be forever. Guess what? He came. Which means the kingdom is here. And it ain't leaving. Praise God. It's not coming, it's here. I had a, a question the Holy Ghost asked me last night. And you can tell when the Lord asks you a question because he keeps repeating it until you respond. He asked me a question last night. I had to write it down. It's such a simple question. The question was, if the kingdom is here, why are you not benefiting from it? I know God cannot lie, and the kingdom is here, according to Jesus. So the question is, why are we not benefiting from it? And he asked it till I got an answer. I got the answer. I'll tell it next week. So don't miss the session. Jesus still speaking about the kingdom. Look at this now. He's fulfilling his call. Luke 4 verse 42. But he said, Jesus speaking, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also. Why? Because that is why I was sent. Luke 17 verse 20. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is within you. He said the kingdom is here, the government of God is already present, and is ruling you from the inside. Oh boy. Oh, I need two more lifetimes. Okay, let me try this path. Look at it. You were never created by God to be ruled by an external government. That's a mouthful. If God's kingdom was affecting the Bahamas, there'll be no one in jail today. There'll be no crime, no abuse, no corruption, no incest, no sexual confusion. God never wanted you and I to be ruled from the outside. The less internal government you have the more external government you need please buy this tape
Can I give you all a little glimpse of how God creates nations? Let me give it to you. God goes to Africa and he picks up slaves who ain't got nothing. He brings them out and puts them in the desert. He says, okay, I'm going to start over. I'm going to create a nation out of you people who are at the bottom. You ain't got nothing. You are slaves. You ain't got no identity. You ain't got no credibility. You ain't got no money. You ain't got nothing. He starts with them. He says, now first I'm going to give you a code. Ten Commandments. Then I'm going to give you a constitution. That's all the laws that I spoke out of my mouth through Moses to give you. He says, now, I want you to just put my laws in your heart. Talk about them. Memorize them. Teach them to your children. Put them in your mind. Convince yourself of them. Brainwash yourself with my laws. And the people just wouldn't cooperate with God. What did they say to God? They said, Moses, tell God we want a king. They were asking for what? External government. God's response was very interesting. God says, Moses, go back and tell the people, I will be their God, they will be my people, and that's all we need. Now the problem is, God is invisible. Oh, hallelujah. In other words, he wanted three million people living and moving in the desert with an invisible government, ruling through their hearts, they are loving one another, respecting one another, not coveting, not committing adultery, not lying, not stealing, and no one knows why. Because their government is invisible. Imagine a people doing right, and no one knows why. That's what he wanted on your job every day. He wanted them to see you doing right, and no one could say why. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. God never wanted you to put on your lapel, I love Jesus. Or on your car, hoink if you know Jesus. He didn't want no labels anywhere. He wanted them to see a lifestyle and a culture that was so different from theirs. They'll say, what's making you live like this? And your answer will be, my kingdom is not of this world. God says, you do not want a king. And Moses went and told the people what God said. Moses says, the Lord God says, you do, not want a, you do not want a king. He will be your king and you will be his people. And they sent Moses back to God. And so you tell God, Watch this now. We want a king like the other nations, they said. Isn't that amazing? We could see theirs ain't working. Come on, y'all talk to me. But yet still, you know, people say, well, we want to go to the first world. What do we mean by that? Put the camera on me. PM, listen to me. What do you mean by that? What is first world? Is it America? Do you want to inherit that garbage? Pornography, death, drugs, crime, huh? divorce, murder? Is that first world? You see, we, we still haven't learned the lesson. We still want a king like the other nations. But I'm telling you, and I gotta, I'm a crazy man. You ain't got to be with me. I'm by myself. But I believe somehow the Bahamas going to go through something. Where God will truly live here. Oh, I feel like screaming from my heart. There'll be a people in the world, in a little island nation, who truly are living, holy, clean, 
disrespectful and no one could see why because in that nation there's an invisible government oh I'm gonna shout all by myself I believe there will be a citizenship in a country where when the politician tells you to do something wrong you will say sir long live mr. MP but I cannot do that why I am obligated to authority higher than you I will not compromise my convictions we need that kind of people oh we need some students in school who would sit up in the class excuse me teacher I don't believe in what you're saying and I didn't come to school with my mother to pay me tuition for listening to this garbage you're teaching either they fire you or I leave the class don't look at me funny we need some students who are under another government they got teachers teaching that two boys are okay together in your school They got in our Bahamas, I found out last week, that there are young girls getting raped by other young girls in the bathrooms in your school. And the teachers are telling them it's natural. Oh, we need some students who are under another government who say, look, we're going to protest. We're going to leave this class until the prime minister and the principal of the school get their act together. We live by a higher law, and in our country, God will live here in Jesus' mighty name. Excuse me, I'm getting beside myself. We're talking about a people who had God as their government, but they chose human agency. And God told him, he said, if you choose this government, let me tell you what they're going to do. And God gave him a long list. God said, first of all, they're going to take taxes from you. In Jamaica, every single citizen must pay, read my lips, 53% tax. That means if you make $100, brother, you only take home $47. The rest belongs to the government of the earth. That is what I call dignified corporate slavery. In California, to live in California, the tax is 43% of everything you earn goes to the state government. That's why you got to be a movie star to live out there. Any other star will go out. That's not, that's not life, that's slavery. And yet in my kingdom, let me stand up here to talk about my kingdom. My kingdom government established 10% from 6,000 years ago and it is still, I'm on a shout out by myself. My government gives you back 90% and that's too much to live on. Give him a hand. Praise God. He's a good God. I say he's a good God. I say he's a good God. And what I like about this God, this government is, they take the 10%, but he don't give it, he don't put it where he is. He leave it right where you are, and he use it to train you to become better. Oh, you don't understand. So you still got 100%. We don't even know we got 100%. Long live the kingdom of God. I said, long live the kingdom of God. Long live the kingdom of God. Long live the kingdom of God. Jesus was teasing them one day. They came to him and they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus says, ah, oh, good question. Let's talk about money. He says, well, give me one of the your, your local government's money. And they gave him some of the money. Now, I don't know if you notice our money. They got pictures of people on it, eh? <laughs> Why? God on that money. Man on that money. So that money don't belong to God. It belongs to the man. So Christ says, okay, whose image is on this? 
They said, Caesar? He said, right. True. He said, now you give to Caesar whatever he asks for, because that's his. But he says, give to God what belongs to God. Well, what belongs to God? He said, only 10% of everything you are plus your whole life. Because the image of God is what you're made in. Therefore, you belong to God. And 10% of everything he gave you belong to him. And the 10% he gives it back to you for development. He said, bring the tithes so that there'll be meat in the house. For who? For the same people who bought the tithe. Oh, no, that's a deal, man. Come on, praise him. That's a deal. He doesn't take it from you. The kingdom of God is the most beautiful message in the world. I'm telling you, friends, every time I board a plane and they fill me up, I smiled at myself. I said... I said to myself, I don't have a weapon, but I am the weapon on this flight. Because no demon can touch this flight if I ever step on board. Y'all don't get the revelation. I'm the weapon. <laughs> Why? He shall give his angels charge concerning me. Not them other folks now, but they can get saved because I happen to be with them. You don't live that way you'll be paranoid for the rest of your life you better get into the kingdom why ain't no safety anywhere else let me tell you something yeah they can blow up anywhere but if you are walking in the kingdom authority under the kingdom government jurisdiction you are safe he says a thousand should fall of your right and ten thousand will fall at your left but it won't come near. don't you all believe the government Some of y'all need to clean up for your business right now. Clean up for your business, brother. Lift your hands and clean for your business. Say, Lord, they may fail on my left. They may go bankrupt on my right. But me, it shall not come near me. I'm going to prosper. You're going to put me in the black. Praise God. No more red lines at the bottom there. Hallelujah. Kingdom of God. Oh, eight minutes. All right. Listen. Now, I want you to, to write this down. John 18. Tell your neighbor, pastor preaching today. No, wait till 2004. And I can start preaching. I get down to the good stuff. See, the kingdom of God is amazing. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. What's kingdom? A government with a constitution, with citizens, with laws, with all kinds of privileges and a code of ethics. He says, I'm bringing you a whole government, an authority, and it's not from this world. He says, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from where? Another place. And that's the way you and I are supposed to live. So Pilate says, so you are a king, huh? Jesus answered, you are right. Now watch this. You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, <laughs> wait a minute, Jesus, I thought you came to die on the cross and shed blood. He said, no. He says, in fact, the reason why I came is really not Calvary, you know. Read it. He said, the reason why I came, in fact, and the reason why I was even born was for this cause that I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Are you a king? He said, that's the reason why I was born. Are you a king? He said, that's the reason why I came. I came because of king and kingdom. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He said, I came as a king. Little lamb, Mary had a little lamb. No, I came as a king. The lamb was just a means. The end is a lion. Yes. Hallelujah. We will not take him off the cross. Why don't we take this man off the cross? That's why we got a crown. Someone says, well, 
Pastor Miles, I just love your ministry, but y'all ain't got no cross in your building. I say, we don't celebrate capital punishment. <laughs> y'all missed it. We celebrate what? Reigning on a throne. He is high and lifted up. And his train fills the temple. Tell your neighbor, remember, but don't live there. Remember the cross. We thank God for the cross. Don't live around that cross. We are seated with Christ around the cross. I don't know what the Bible says. The Bible says, we are seated with Christ. How? In heavenly places. And we are what? Reigning with him. In life. You become what you keep seeing. 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 Every week you go to this place and there are crosses everywhere. People hanging dead. Oh, everybody dead. Everything you see, dead people, dead. I mean, after 30 years, you begin to think, I'm dead too. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the 11 men that he left, Never went back to that spot. Never built anything there. Come on, y'all talk to me. Explain that to me. Matter of fact, the last thing we heard about them was they were outside on a hill looking up. And that was him when he arose. Christ says, Christ says, I'm going, and they watch it. And they stay there for hours just watching. Watching, 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 watching. And God said, you know something? They, 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 they ain't gonna move. So he said, Gabriel, go down there and get them brothers from that spot. Come on, y'all talk to me. And the angels came and said, what? Why stand you here? Y'all talk to me. Some of y'all just hanging around the cross. And God is saying, what you doing here? Go into life and reign. Take dominion. Take priority. Dominate. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I told you last week, Jesus won the war. Now we got to win the peace. That's what Bush doing. Yeah. They're trying to win the peace now. See, the war finished. And some of us still fighting. And because the devil ain't there to fight, we shooting one another. Pew, killing our own brothers and sisters. We must understand that he came to be a king. He was only a servant as a means. The end is to be king. He was a lamb as a means. The end is to be a lion. The last thing that John saw in the book of Revelation with Jesus was that he was a lion. Come on, y'all talk to me. The lion had some holes in his hands, but he was a lion. Our Lord ain't no sissy. <laughs> He's bad out there, man. Don't fool with him. He'll growl and wipe you over his growl. Matter of fact, he's so awesome, his shout don't wake the dead up. Oh, y'all ain't ready to let's punch it. Should have shout right there. I mean, he even ain't gotta come get it, he's gotta shout. And every dead in Christ. That's the power of our king. He's so awesome. He can break the power of the grave with a word. That's what you served this week. Jesus came to restore man back to his kid. Look at Luke 4. I must preach the good news, he says, of the kingdom, because that is why I came. 
Why did he come to earth? Luke 12. I want you to write this verse down. Do not be afraid, little flock, he says. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid, little flock. The father's pleasure is to give you the kingdom. God is only pleased when you get the kingdom. Not when you get religion. When you get the kingdom. And it's so critical. The kingdom, therefore, is your future and your past. Matthew 25, I love it. It says, verse 34, Come you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, which is the kingdom, prepared for you before the creation of the world. Another verse that blows my mind, Revelation 5.10. Oh, I love this one. Here's the end of your future. It says, You have made us a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. That's from your Bible. You think heaven is your future. You got to read the end of the book. The end of the book ends on earth. God says he will make you what? A kingdom of priests. Remember, they try to separate the church and government. God does not. You are a priest and a king. You are spiritual and you are administrative. You relate and you dominate. You commune and you control. You do all of that. You are priest because you represent heaven. You are king because you dominate earth. And so you are a royal priesthood. We keep dividing the body of Christ. And separating it from government. And the body of Christ is government. Let me close with this verse a verse we ended on last week I want you to find it in your Bible because it's controversial and then I want to pray I'll just stop here and pick up next week the law and the prophets everyone please underline this verse please this is probably the most important verse you read in the Bible for the next 10 years Jesus Christ is speaking Jesus Christ is closing out one era and opening another one in this one verse Jesus Christ is shutting down the Old Testament and opening the New Testament in this one verse Luke 16 verse 16 and 17 Jesus said quote the law and the prophets were preached until John when were they preached until John how long did they preach them until John so all the laws in the Old Testament and the prophecies are preached until John since that time, I quote, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. He just shut down the Old Testament. Since that time, since John, there's a new message you go and preach. And that is the kingdom of God. And everyone is forcing his way into it, he says. Everyone's trying to find it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Now, what's he talking about? He says, everything that was prophesied is coming to pass now. And everything that they told you will happen when now comes is happening and is going to happen. Hallelujah. Oh, I can't wait for next session. Ooh, can't wait. <laughs> oh, you hear? Remember Daniel? Daniel talked about the Messiah. And Daniel says, Oh, I saw the kingdoms of this world. And then a big rock came out of heaven. <laughs> Smashed that statue. <laughs> Ground it into powder. And then the rock began to grow. And the rock filled the whole earth. Rocks don't grow. Daniel says, and this kingdom filled the whole earth and it enveloped all the other kingdoms. Rocks don't grow. 
then you read Matthew 16 verse 18 it says who do men say that I am some say you are Elijah John the Baptist come back from the dead a prophet he said who do you say that I am they said you are the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus said you got that right and upon this rock Lord have mercy go into a rock again upon this rock I will build my ecclesia my government and not even the grave can stop its expansion when you die it still runs your life <laughs> even death can't cut you off from this government it even goes behind the grave and still rules your life and brings you back when it's ready this rock and he's the cornerstone we were in Israel we've been there many times and many of you have seen the picture of Israel in photographs and you normally saw this golden dome in the middle you ever seen a golden dome yeah that's the Alaska mosque it is a Muslim temple on the mount now listen carefully we were allowed to go into that mosque went there twice we took groups there to see and when you go in there they make you take your shoes off and women got to cover themselves as a Muslim place and and you go inside this place and it's their most holy site in the Middle East there in Israel now when we went in there that mosque is built the way it's built that golden dome that golden dome is covering a mountain there's a mountain they call it the temple mount it's a mountain and that is the mountain where you'll find a big rock the rock still there now the rock is massive I think the rock must be about half of the size of this stage a massive rock right on top of this hill on top of the mountain but you can't see it because it's in that building and this rock has a flat surface on the top and this is the same mountain according to tradition that Abraham went to to offer his son Isaac so he went to this mountain and that's where he found the ram and everything and this rock was supposed to be the main place where Isaac built the altar and put his son to kill his son remember that story this is supposed to be the same mountain and that rock as Abraham's experience at that rock it's the same mountain where Solomon built the temple that he built the one that everyone talks about it was right over that rock most important place in Jewish history is that mountain the most important place to the Muslims in that area is that mountain because it's that mountain and that rock they claim that Muhammad left and went to heaven, spirit went to heaven from that mountain. I'm trying to get you to understand something. So the Jews got this rock as their most important rock. The Muslims got this rock as their most important rock. So here I was in a building with a rock. Outside, the Jews praying for this temple to collapse. Inside, the Muslims bowing. And praying for the temple to stay and me I in the middle and I'm standing there and there are these Muslims reaching through the hole in the, in the little thing and they just want to touch the rock and they they eating the dirt from it it's so holy and everybody and you can't really reach it it's just this grill behind it you know and everybody just want to touch the rock and they cry in just to touch the rock and you got the Jews outside planning and hoping one day to build their temple back on the rock and I stood there and something happened to me this all comes down to a rock
everybody is fighting over a rock. The Muslims travel thousands of miles to see the rock. The Jews travel thousands of miles to see the rock. And everybody's praying to the rock. And I heard the voice of Jesus in that temple. And I felt like saying it loudly, but I knew I'd probably get in trouble. Maybe even killed. But it came over me, Barry. You've been there many times. It came over me, and I, and I saw a picture of Jesus in my mind on the day of the high feast. All those people bowing down at this rock. And that picture of Jesus came upon me. And I saw Jesus when they were breaking the jugs of water. And the water was running all over the terrace. And the people were running, lapping up the water, the holy water from the priest. And Christ stood there and stopped the whole ceremony and said, Hold it! Moses gave you water in the desert, but you thirst again. Come unto me, all you who are thirsty. And I will give you a drink that you will never thirst again. That's what he did. Well, I felt like doing it that day in that temple. I felt like saying, hold it. This is not the rock. You ain't got to come looking for the rock. The rock came looking for you. The rock is not in a place. It can come in your heart. The rock that we seek. Upon this rock, I build my ecclesia. You don't have to face the east for God to hear you anymore. No, I'm getting close here by. We're getting ready to go now. You ain't got to bow seven times toward Mecca. You ain't got to go to a wall anymore, even though we appreciate the wall. You ain't got to go to the wall anymore and pray your prayers at the wall. It's a rock. There's a rock that grows. The rock is here. And the woman said to Jesus, you Jews worship in the temple and we Samaritans we worship in the mountain and Jesus answered woman the hour will come and now is that they that worship the true God they don't worship in a temple in Jerusalem nor in a mountain on a rock but they that worship him will now worship him in spirit and in truth for where you are there will I be also we will come and make our abode in you for the kingdom of God is within you best news in the world is the kingdom of God God bless you Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.